I'd like to, uh, Marg's already done it, but for me as an Indigenous woman coming onto someone else's country, I'd like to acknowledge the, the traditional custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal people, um, and acknowledge the, the um, culture that is continuing, the contribution that um, they make to everyday life for this city and this region. Um, I also would like to acknowledge any uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are in this room today and, um, and I've obviously welcome everybody here. Okay, so Marg touched on it briefly, but um, because of what I talk about, I'm pretty blunt. Um, I, I'm, I am very blunt and I will try and watch my potty mouth today. Um, but I, I said I'd try. Um, that's about all I can offer. Um, but I really want to encourage you guys with the self-care. Um, my story is quite blunt and it is hard at times to talk about. I'm pretty cool with it because I, I just sort of say it enough times and kind of rolls off but I do know that it has a consequence for other people so you know if you're having problems you slow steady breathing as Mark said take a quick break but you know if you go in the toilet do tell them to back off boundaries and all of that um, connect with somebody at the session so at the back table you've got the um, PB ACT team there um, drink of water utilizing your grounding techniques so being aware of your surroundings that you're in the moment and and I think the biggest thing, and it's difficult for survivors, is acknowledging that what you're feeling is okay. So it's okay to feel whatever it is that comes up. It's valid, it's worthwhile, and you're allowed to go through that. Okay, so um, before I can tell you about um, my courageous hope, I want to share a little bit more about me. So my name is Faith Nakamara Gray. Um, Nakamara is my skin name, my cultural name. I was born in Alice Springs, but my mum is originally from Queensland, um, as was my father's, um, and I use that term generously, my father's family. His mother was a uh, full-blood Aboriginal woman from Blackhall, which is central Queensland. Um, but when he took my mum from the Redcliffe area where we live out to Alice Springs, he moved her to a remote community called Yuendamu, which is on Walpuri country. And um, I was given, even though I was born in Alice Springs after they left community, I was being adopted into the Walpuri mob, so um, I was given Nakamura. The name is uh, gives me place, tells me who I am in the group. Um, people know the guys when they come up who, you, who your name is, and Nakamura, and they go, "Oh, I, I'm for you," or "Who oh, can't go near you?" And the, the waters part basically. It's a protective factor. It's a sense of identity, and it's a big part of who I am. Um, as Marg said, I'm a single mum of two children. I have a daughter in junior high and I have a little boy who will be five in a few months. So there's quite a bit of a gap where, thank God, I'm only equipped for two children and, and just. so. Um, but it does give me a bit of a, a diverse range of uh, parenting realms at the moment. I've got one that um, doesn't have a bedroom door because she slams it too much, so I just took it off the hinges. And then I've got another one who, I know, it's terrible. Um, and, the, and my little boy, I rang to talk to him this morning and I got nothing out of him except what was on ABC for kids. So one extreme to the other. Um, I am a non-church attending Christian, so my faith is very important to me. Um, like I said, I swear like a well-educated sailor, but um, my faith is very much a part of who I am. But at this point in time, going into a church is still not something I do well. tried it a few months ago at a, an event. It's more of a undercover kind of sussing out what their actual policies and idea of justice was and I had the worst panic attack I'd had in a long time and couldn't breathe. I went, ah, we're not doing this. Um, so I don't go to church. But I am also the daughter of a single mother. My mum had three sons from her first marriage and then she had her one black duck with me. Um, courtesy of my father, I have the joy of being a sister an auntie and a cousin to far too many. And I say far too many because there's still about 30 of my sisters left. Um, he was a very busy person. Um, so I don't remember birthdays or anything like that. Um, I'm a friend, I'm a mentor, I'm an educator, an entrepreneur, a writer, a reader, a, per a political and social activist. Um, I'm in any rally I can get to. My kids have got all sorts of t-shirts and banners in our house. It's quite, you know, grand activist central. Um, but my mum was um, the guiding force for me in, whilst my mum didn't know what was happening to me, and I'll get into that soon, she taught me about enduring. Didn't matter what mum went through, 
she keeps going and she still does. She's just turned 71 and she is the most tough woman. I mean, I can leave her with my very active children and have no concerns whatsoever that she'll be able to keep up. Um, I have a lived experience of child sexual abuse in the church. Um, I was sexually abused by a member of a living family member who also prostituted me from the time I was seven to 14. Um, then he got a girlfriend, which was great. He um, was a bit distracted with someone his own age. And then I realised that school was getting harder and I didn't know how to get through. Having much older brothers, there's seven to 14 years between myself and my brothers, they had alcohol that mum didn't know about and they couldn't dob when I drank it on them because we weren't meant to have alcohol in a Christian home. And when high school got tough, I had to get drunk to get through school. It was all I could do to cope. So I was um, on good amount of vodka every morning before I got to school and I ended up selling myself to access that alcohol from the time I was 14 to 16. It got me through to the end of year 10. Um, I have also a lived experience of uh, sexual violence as a young adult. Um, forced uh, torture, courtesy of a, an ex-boyfriend. Um, Domestic and family violence, that's where I got my daughter from, was a, a very violent relationship and it's a story for another time when there's a few drinks around but I also managed to fall foul of a bikey gang and that happened because of a date with a butcher from my local Woolies. So my life is one of those lies where you never know quite what's going to come out and um, which is why I was really big on the self-care. Okay, so Courageous Hope is um, the creation of my determination that absolutely... Um, nothing that I've been through will be in vain. I feel like I have come through despite my own best efforts at times um, and I have to have something to show for it. Being upright, being semi-functional, raising somewhat functional children, that's not enough for me. Um, I have to have something to show for it. I'm all about legacy. The one thing my father left me when he passed away about 12 years ago, he wasn't in my life, but he was probably the biggest influence in my life in that his life left a long legacy that we're still living with each day. And um, so my focus is creating a legacy. And this is my legacy. Um, it's about creating a place of safety. So at the moment, it's just a Facebook page because I'm tech, I can't do technological stuff. So my website's a bit of a hack job at the moment. Um, but at the moment, it's a Facebook page. We will be working toward getting a venue. Um, but I want a place where women can walk in and feel safe feel okay I'm safe to be here I can drop my bundle I can come in and do what I need to do um, and I, I guess in the intro as well Marg talked about you know my my thinking around empowerment um, I go to a lot of community meetings and networking things and I have the privilege of speaking at different community service clubs and and I always like to say so what is it that you do tell me what it is that is a priority for you and they always talk about oh we're about empowering women and I kind of go oh Really? It sounds great, but I can't gel with that thinking because for me, empowerment is about creating the resources for someone to pick up and empower themselves. The most significant times in my life have been where I have taken what's been available to me and sometimes there hasn't been much available and I've scraped it together and I've come through. And to me, that's a definition of empowerment, something I've done for myself. And that's what I want to create. It's basically a shopping centre where women can come in and pick up the resources they need um, to create their own journey, their own unique tailor-made recovery. Uh, one of the things I'm frequently asked um, is why is it a female-only service? Um, the reason is I can only work within my expertise. I'm a cisgendered woman. I can only speak to what it is as my experience of, of being a woman and being a female survivor. Also, as an Indigenous woman, I can't work with men in that space on that issue. Um, we, I do partner with organisations that work with men um, and it's great that we have that partnership but there's definitely that divide in how we do that round to work. Um, and I also wouldn't dishonour men by trying to speak to what it is to be a male survivor of sexual violence. Um, the men are quite capable of setting up their own thing so we'll partner with anyone that's doing some good work but at the, that, this is what we do. We're, we're here for women. 
um, through, now it's a new organisation, we're actually not fully launching at the moment, I'm sort of sitting in my bed and working, my bedroom is my office which is really poor sleep hygiene but it's how we make it work, it's a door, there's a door my kids can't come through, if the door's shut my kids know mum's working or eating chocolate that they don't know about. Um, but next year, we're going to be rolling out the programs. Um, I'm testing some of them out, um, with, like with working with young teenage girls, basically, so I'm getting out there and saying, you know, I'm not all talk, this is what I do. And these girls going from Ds to Bs and As, you know, they're evidence that I do actually know a little bit about what I'm talking about, even though I don't have the qualifications to show you that. Um, and I think there's a whole bunch of uh, programs and I'm going to go through them just so that you get an overview of, of where I'm coming from, what I'm building up to. Um, and I think the one thing I wanted to sort of really clarify is um, up where I'm at, north of Brisbane and Redcliffe, we've got quite a good a growing community of, of women who um, aren't cisgendered, transgender um, and have those fluid uh, pansexual um, ish, uh, identities. And uh, one of the things I'm talking with some of my great friends to work out, how do we make sure that we're a safe service? So it's for anyone that walks in and says, I'm a woman, I've experienced sexual violence or exploitation and I need help. So we're making sure that we are doing best practice in making sure any woman that walks through our door is welcome and safe. Okay, this is a quote um, that my daughter actually found for me quite some time ago. The desire to reach for the stars is ambitious. A desire to reach hearts is wise. And um, one of the, I don't always do it, but I'm trying, particularly with my daughter being 12, um, to bring her along with what I'm doing. And it's really tricky because um, I talk to her, she's been, both of my children are raised with protective behaviours, and I've done it from birth. I started the minute they came out, I'm changing a nappy and doing all the stuff and talking to them. But as they get older, I've found myself with my daughter in particular, because she's my clone, she looks just like me, um, having those difficulties and being able to bring her along and wanting to shut her out because I'm thinking, is that too much information? How much is enough? How much is too much? And I sort of sat her down one day and I just said, you know, honey, this is why mum does what she does. This is why we have the boundaries in place. This is why I am pretty much a Nazi when it comes to your access to computers and why you don't have an iPhone and, and um, all of those, you know, life cramping things that are going to destroy you and there'll be therapy for that later. But, you know, this is why I do it and this is a bit of my story. And, and she just said, how do you get people to listen? And I said, I guess I'm talking to them about the why behind the what. And that's when she went looking for this quote. So she drives me insane and we headbutt. Oh, my God, we headbutt. Um, but she does get it and she comes up with gems like this. So this is actually on my bedroom wall. It's on laminated on my shower wall. So I see it and focus on the why behind the what, which is to reach people's hearts. Okay, so this is basically we've got six core programs that we'll be running next year. Um, the top one is Living Again. And this program is for survivors of child sexual abuse, sexual violence or exploitation. Um, for women that come in who are like me, have very little or no memory of life before abuse. Um, it's more like a living life on my terms kind of program. For others, it's a chance to um, reclaim and rebrand life that they had before the sexual assault or exploitation. And again, for others, it's creating a whole new life. So they might come in with a memory of a life before but look at the risk factors and look at the things that made them vulnerable and go, okay, I want a whole new life. And this is program is about exploring um, and, and digging up gems and hidden treasures within women. And when you're told for a long time that you're not good enough, that you can't do it, you're stupid, you're ignorant, you're this, that and the other, this is a place to go, you know, screw it. We're, that's out. So let's find out what you are made of and what, what we're going to do with that. Um, and... Again, the name Courageous Hope has come from um, a place. I get a lot of people going, oh, you know, your name's Faith. Why didn't you call it Courageous Faith? I'm like, well, because that's my name and that would be really tacky. Um, <laughs> and then, okay, no, it's hope. And I said, unless you've been so broken and so decimated by life or by people's actions, you don't get how much courage it ha you have to have, that you have to muster to have hope. And that is the name of the, the organisation for that reason, because you have to be courageous to dare to hope, to risk on purpose to hope. 
Okay, the next program is Emerging Destiny, which is my young girls program. And I love getting the calls from the school saying, we've got this girl, she's on her second suspension, she's just done something, third one, you know what that means. And I'm like, oh, give me 10 minutes, I'll be there, you're not kicking her out. And they're going, she doesn't want to be here. I don't care. She actually does. You just haven't figured out how to get it, get her there. Um, and I try to get them when they're on the suspension. Hopefully, I'll be partnering with a couple of the local PCYCs. They run a, uh, where I'm at. They run um, some programs, basically babysitting these kids that get kicked out. And there's not much more than making sure they don't go and get arrested. And that's again not good enough for me. It's giving these girls a vacation, and I'm not about that. I left school at year ten. And whilst I managed to muster, a, I think it was an A and three Bs after not being there for about six months of the year, um, I don't want those girls following in my path. Whilst I've got a pretty wide and varied uh, CV, um, it's been hard work and I want to stop these girls going through that cycle. I became a single mum because I didn't think I could do anything else. I didn't feel empowered. I got in a dodgy relationship that was violent, got my daughter and went, oh, well, that was my lot in life. I was going to be a single mother anyway. So for these girls, um, we go and the service delivery is very different. So I will do it one-on-one, -on -one. preferably I'll get a group. Um, we get the girls in and we do a really fast-paced learning course. So it can be run over, I like to stretch it out in the one-on-ones over 12 weeks and get these girls doing some work. So we mix, mix it up. It's more fast-paced than in a classroom, which is what they're not engaging with anyway. And we go through leadership qualities. We do a risk assessment. What, are, what is it that you're so pissed off about anyway, sweetheart? You know, you're throwing things, you're swearing at your teachers. What are you so pissed off about? And they frequently won't have a clue. So we unpack all of that and go, okay, and we go through the reflective practice. So we teach them reflective practice. We give them really strong um, skills that help them monitor what it is that they need to succeed and we start doing goal setting. When I'm working with the group, we have individual, and I start introducing them to the jargon of the workplace, so KPIs, and so they have to set um, goals as a group and goals as an individual, and then maintain and show me what they're doing to work and achieve those accountabilities, both as a team member and as an individual. And that's, again, those mental health principles about connectivity to community. So are you not just an island? What you do impacts other people. So if you don't rock up and I've got to go drag your butt here and we're 45 minutes late, well, you've just taken 45 minutes away from your group to achieve what you guys committed to doing and actually let the group sort that out. And that can be quite um, <clears throat> challenging, especially with some of the girls that throw things first and then think about other ways of handling it two weeks later. Um, but we're getting them. And once we get through that program, and I'll do it one-on-one -on -one with the girls if it's appropriate, if they don't want to do group work or if their behaviours are at a level where it's just not feasible to work with a group. So once we go through that, and again, the leadership qualities um, to teach, um, I'm really big on leadership development. And uh, one of the things that the strongest leadership quality is learning how to follow. So I'm teaching these kids to be a real leader, you also know how to have, have to follow. That means at school, in the workplace, in the family, there's a time to show your leadership by following. Um, and then through all the, the goal setting and we identify their strengths and okay, so maybe you'll go back to school, but maybe you're not, maybe you are done with it and we can't help that. So how do we get you work ready? Because I'm not gonna see you behind a checkout for the rest of your days until you meet some dude that was just the love of your life and it's gonna be rosy and you get pregnant, but he'll look after you, oh, he'll be there. And, and it's okay, and then Centrelink. Oh, but that's okay, mum was on Centrelink and none of us have ever had a job and it doesn't matter, education's not that. So we're setting goals and okay, so we identify whether it's hospitality. And what we're doing now is partnering them up with a mentoring relationship for 12 months with an industry leader. And that is a supported mentoring relationship. So we work with the mentor and the participant one-on-one -on -one and together throughout that 12-month period so that we're not coming down after four months and I ring the employer and go, so how's she going? Oh, well, she didn't rock up. We're making sure that we're supporting the employer and that because we want a sustainable program. Um, and after that, you know, whether they start working with that person or they are encouraged, hopefully, back into furthering their education, it's just another way of tricking them back into education, basically. Um, but getting the work skilled ready. It's not an accredited program, but there are elements within the training that they can RPL later with further study. Okay, so workplace aware is, um, again, looking at um, sustainability for women. 
um, it's for businesses and, and non-government organisations across all the sectors to ensure that um, family violence and sexual violence um, survivors are supported at work. It's making them aware of the impact. Um, when we were still living in Alice, my mum's boss, she was working for a small business, one of the ladies left her very abusive husband and the boss, he tried to help her, he gave her a little bit of leeway but eventually he got sick of it and he sacked her. Two days later she was murdered by her ex-husband and that was not long before we left Alice and I remember mum's boss, he was like a, a big brother to me and he said, what could I have done differently? I said, well, we're not blaming here but... And it made me think, what was he needing? What was missing for him as an employer, particularly of a small business, to support her so that she would be safe at work? And there were risk factors because she was doing a job that was driving around town. And they're the things that we want to do is go in and work with the workplace and say, okay, so what is it that your staff need to do? Let's look at every role and let's make sure that we're looking at all eventualities. So you're going to maintain your output. We understand the need on business, but we need to keep these women in work um, my son is a product of sexual assault. He's, he's my rape baby and that's a lot of people balk at that when I say that. And I'm like, well, he is a rape baby. Deal with it. It was my reproductive choice to, to have him and raise him. And it happened in a situation which legally I can't really talk about, but let's just say that my employer at the time was not supportive and I had a lengthy period of being harassed and people not knowing why would you have a baby if you'd been raped and was it really rape and all of those things. It was like... You know, I was working 80 hours a week at that point. And so my emotions were frazzled and new pregnancy, every preg both pregnancies that I t had to term were, um, I was exhausted the first trimester. So I was not in the mood for anyone's opinions at that point. And I lost my job. I went on leave and I went, okay, screw it. Went on maternity leave early and, and I, I got my contract and everything paid out. But it made, again, made me realise, okay, so I lost my job. I've lost my house. I've lost my car. I was blessed because I had an option to move in with my mum. And it was so cosy, a two-bedroom unit, me rocking up with two kids. But we got there. And um, now she lives with us in a bigger house, so payback is, is there. But we're going, the, the thing is, how do we support employers to support women? We want to keep women safe. If I hadn't had my mum and a safe place to go, I could have lost both my children to the welfare system because I wouldn't have been able to keep them housed and keep them safe. And this is a reality. I'm seeing too many women who have been survivors of sexual violence lose their kids. And being in a shelter, you can't protect them as much as you think. Um, being on the board of the Women's Shelter in Alice, didn't matter what protective things we had in place. When you've got traumatised kids, they're going to do things to each other. So, you know, again, it's that child protection stuff as well. And also helping employers manage vicarious trauma for all their colleagues and for themselves and for the colleagues that work with them unaffected because there is that, that impact. Um, now, launch pad to success, uh, to business creation. I haven't come up with a nice little catchy two-word label, so that's a work in progress. But this is basically an interest-free microloan program for women to create their own small businesses um, from skills they've either discovered through the Living Again program um, or a long-held desire, something that they've always wanted to do and haven't dared tell anyone or didn't know how it was going to happen. Um, so in the 16-17 financial year, we're going to launch the program and have on the team somebody who's a lot smarter than I am with business because I get really dizzy. I'm, I'm great at writing, but when it comes to maths, I'm like, Pff. anyway, I haven't been able to help my daughter with homework for a couple of years now. Um, and someone that's – so we'll have a business project manager that will be there to help with the, the red tape, the stuff, all the, the reporting, the taxation, all of those things to make the business successful. Um, now, the recipients um, can also do something for social enterprise. So it doesn't have to be a business. Whether they want to set up a, a new awareness event or something like that, we'll fund that and we'll give someone an opportunity because Courageous Hope isn't about my voice. It is at the moment, which I'm really not comfortable with. I don't – don't enjoy <laughs> being public at this point, but I want to create a, a platform for women to come in and go, okay, this is what I want to do. Can you help me do it? So we're going to have loans to do that. And how do we do that? We'll connect them up with community groups who are already doing stuff. So they've got the manpower, they're ready to go. So they're not out there doing it. And again, those mental health determinants, making sure that connectivity to community, because I know when I haven't coped, I've, I've hidden away and I've shut out people and not returned calls and and done that kind of thing. So we want to connect these women back into the community or connect them for the first time 
if they've been with an abusive partner for a long time, they're not going to have those connections. Um, we're going to have a, 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 a place that we're going to have. So I'm looking at venues next month. We're doing the shopping for a, a, a venue. I want to buy it. So um, there's going to be one corporation that I'm targeting and saying, you don't want to keep talking and hearing me rammer on about this, so you're going to buy the building for me. We'll, we'll stick your name on the side, but we want a space that is ours, that we can create all these other programs. But we want to have a, a co-working space so they can come in and have a shared space and also that connecting with other people, that sense of belonging, so it's not isolating. Um, and that's going to help get those businesses up and running. Um, and on site for all the programs we have, we are going to have um, a childcare program for the zero to fives, which is, again, making sure we're an accessible service for women. Um, and all the childcare staff, we're going to have them child trauma trained because we want to have that holistic support. We want to make sure that the kids are getting what their needs met, that they are... Um, they're getting the support because I know for me when I've been trying to raise my children, particularly my daughter, um, and I've been dealing with everything and she didn't know what was going on. Um, I had 27 years of sexual violence, so I've only just turned 34. So I was parenting for a good chunk of that and having to hide that from my daughter. And I didn't do what I needed to to get well for a long time and because I was focusing on her. I didn't want Hadassah to be impacted by what was happening to me that she didn't know about. I didn't need her seeing mum as a basket case. So I invested in her, but I suffered. And consequently, I can see that she suffered. So we want to make sure that the kids are taken care of so mum can get down to focus on what she needs. Um, and again, you know, teaching those protective behaviours from that early years. So mum can take a little bit of a step back and just go, OK, this is what it is. And it also gives the, the kids an opportunity to see mum in a whole new light. And that's one of the best things I know... Um, like I said, I have a, a challenging relationship with my daughter and when she sees me doing stuff, like she was not speaking to me yesterday, but just before she got out of the car when I dropped her off at school and, and I said, have a great day. And she turned around and she went, mum, I don't like the fact that you're going away, but it's kind of cool that you get to talk to people. I went, yeah, it is kind of cool. Hey. And she went, yeah, it doesn't mean like I get what you're doing or whatever. Don't do it at my school. And I'm like, okay, but... There was that moment, that little insight where, you know, uh, I said, well, I promise you I will do it at your school just because I can and because they've said no, which means that's my yes because I ignore them because they don't want me there because they don't want to be forward thinking. And I said, so I will embarrass you, but thank you. I, I know you're proud of me. And she went, I didn't say that, for God's sake. And that was how we left it. It was like, <laughs> yay. Um, but she's getting to see mum in a new light. And I want to give that to other mums because there is nothing better than that stubborn little little you that you cloned actually going hey you're actually pretty cool and I love what you're doing and I see what you're building church culture now this is my this is my really this is my pet project it's my personal mandate it's my professional mandate as I said I am a survivor of of child sexual abuse in the Pentecostal church system so of the I grew up in Alice Springs which is where the abuse took place and I spent the first 30 years of my life there but um, it was of the biggest umbrella of Pentecostal churches. So I'll let you guys figure out where that's at. Um, my lawyers told me to behave myself. But I had the trauma compounded by the accompanying mental, emotional and spiritual abuse. Um, so a core part of our identity, as I said, is my Indigenous uh, culture, who I am, my place. But another big part of my identity is my spirituality. Uh, I'm a spiritual being, um, but... You know, it's, it's how I connect, but it's really hard when that gets warped or, or constructed in a way that you feel like you're actually not connecting to what you know you really need. Um, my experience in the church was by four years of age, I was an expert at giving oral sex. Um, by five, I was no longer a virgin in the penis to vagina virginity construct. Um, I have a clicky hip that still plays up Mary Hell. Um, as I said, by seven, I was being pimped by a family member. And um, he learnt he learnt what he learnt from those people who were abusing me. The ministers that were coming through, they could see that there was not, there was not all right between my relationship with that, that family member. And they, they groomed him. And they taught him, out of his own trauma, 
how to, to be more successful in, in pimping and grooming me and breaking me down. Um, so at the core of the church, the church abuse was the worst. I can say the physical stuff and yes, the hip is a major problem for me. Um, but the spiritual abuse was the worst. I was told that um, by people in the church, people that my mum thought were her friends, that I was unlovable, that I was an un, um, a filthy, unwanted slut and a whore, that my father left because he didn't want to be around me. They didn't tell me what they actually knew was that the fraud squad were after him for bigamy, amongst other things, and that he left before I was born. Um, and my family didn't talk about stuff. We were just like, oh, it happened and I'll tell you later. We never got to the later until I was an adult and I sort of said, we're doing this. So they got away with a lot of their lies. And that's a big thing why we have to talk to kids about. We don't have secrets. We get it out there. We put it out there because these people get away with it because we're not teaching our kids to ask the questions and feel confident to do that. Um, I was humiliated for uh, um, my height, six foot three now, but I was always above above the, the height with everyone else. I was a chubby kid. I had these Roger Rabbit teeth and uh, thank God for orthodontists. Um, and for being, I was the ugly kid. I was the half-breed black bastard child. It was a very white church. Um, my mum being white, I always have to go, oh, that's right, we're not a fully black family. We've got the white one in the house. Um, and, and for being a single parent kid, because in a lot of churches, you've got to be you know, the heterosexual married couple, no sex before marriage, have your children. And that's great if that's how you see the world. But we've always got to remember that our values impact other people and particularly children. And I was also told that hell was created just for me. I was a pretty questioning child, but I never questioned why, uh, what happened to every other terrible person that went to hell before I was born. You know, I was just so sold on that, that hell was made just for me. Um, and that terrified me. I was told that the promises of God that we hear about in the Bible weren't for me, not for everyone but you. And I was, so I was the exception to the rule. Didn't matter what was happening, it wasn't for me. I still struggle with birthdays because I was punished and, and ridiculed and told, oh, your mother doesn't have the money for those presents for you. And my God, the guilt that was on me. The adults who covered up for the abuse were active there were people that, women that procured me for their husbands. I'll never understand that. I will never, ever understand how you can remain um, married and sharing a, a bed and a home with a man that abuses children. I won't get it, let alone how they go and source the kids. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine last night at dinner and, and I said, you know, it's funny the behaviours that we take from childhood. I said, I walk into a room now. I said, as we walk through the restaurant, Mark, I said, you know, I was looking for the exits I said, I've been doing that my whole life. And she said, well, that was a survival thing. I said, no, no, that's great. It's a strength thing that I had as a child and I honour that. And I said, but I don't know. It's, I said, it still rings true with me that the whole kids will do what they have to do. But every exit, very rarely did I get through those exits because there was usually a wife there stopping me getting through. Or there was a church elder or deacon who had his wife keeping my mum busy because my mum was the... the my mum's very committed to God. She's very, um, she doesn't go to church anymore either, but she, in the back in the day, she was a deaconess and she organised the cleaning of the church and the communion and we were at church on a Monday night for prayer meeting, Wednesday night for Bible study, Friday night prayer, cleaning the church on Saturday, got there at seven in the morning on Sunday to get everything set up for church and then there was usually a lunch because someone was coming or someone was leaving or someone was getting hitched and then there was the evening service. So life was church and there was a, I think there was a midweek meeting at the home too for a while. There was always something that kept mum busy and someone that made sure. And it didn't matter how many exits I saw, I didn't get away. And that completely swayed me. And it threw me, it shut me down. I remember thinking, what is it all about? I was, um, I was suicidal and self-harming from the age of six. I distinctly remember one day being six years old, sitting around the side of my house, trying to remember from a gory movie, again, older brothers, they have the, the uses, and trying to work out whether you cut up or, or across because I was done. I was six. And that was because I couldn't take the torment of church, which was a big part of our life. And the, the culture that enables is... is um, 
one of the big things for me in this program around church culture, there is a culture that enables. We have our groups. We walk into it. And in my experience, I'm, I'm not, my mum has grew up at Anglican, but Pentecostal churches, you walk into a church and they have all their groups. They have their connect groups, their cell groups. They've got the, the, parent, the couples with kids, the couples without kids groups. There's the, the women that are praying to God for a husband. Never joining that one. Um, oh, seriously. And they see me walk in without a wedding ring and two kids and they go, and we've got the single parents group, but maybe you'd be interested in the, the women that are praying for a husband. I'm like, <laughs> no, <laughs> Why? seriously don't do that to me but it's that it is that culture and, and I, okay it's great to have groups that connect people but it is easy pickings for a predator walking into a church to find out who isn't as valued because you can see where all the single mobs sit together especially the indigenous single mums you can see where these really creepy cliche predator types gravitate toward they go toward the groups that are the most vulnerable. They don't have to worry about all this pesky grooming business. They don't have to groom a child because it's done because of the culture. And that's what I want to do with this church culture um, program. And I I think a big part of church culture is also we've all seen the Royal Commission into institutional responses. And I made a decision for quite a few reasons um, not to go to the commission myself. Um, Basically, I didn't feel that I was strong enough given the the over a decade of, of legal harassment to try and silence me before that. I had six friends from different parts of Australia who, um, who they died by suicide quite a few years ago, over a decade now, because of the deliberate program that was set out to try and silence us and unfortunately they didn't make it through. I was the only one of our little, not so we called ourselves a not so secret super seven. We were the, the belligerent kids that just went screw it, I'm talking. Um, but unfortunately they didn't make it and without their support I didn't think I could go through with it. I don't have a lot of names either. I don't have names of the people that abused me because I was a child. (laughs) I didn't ask for names. If there was a penis line up I could probably do that quite well but somehow I don't think that's how the Royal Commission work. But um, what it highlighted to me and I've been contacted by a lot of other silent survivors listening to the case, case studies We're not unique. And whilst I didn't go to the Royal Commission, I did fight for 11 years on and off to meet with the president of the biggest um, group of Pentecostal churches. And late last year, 10 months ago, I made that happen. I jumped through so many uh, loops and and hoops and did this sort of uh, tap dance around, um, what was it, conflict of interest. Every time I said, okay, that's dealt with, they go, oh, we've got another conflict. You can't meet with him. I went, pfft. Okay, well, I, that's, that's done. I've taken care of that. So what, what do you got now? Eventually, I got the meeting with him and he brought a lawyer, which was so much fun. I took a friend who's um, a well-known author and she's got this presence that, excuse the language, but, you know, she's got a fuck you presence. And I was more scared of backing down around her than I was of my fear that I might capitulate to the, the demigod status of the pastor that I was meeting with. And I went there to talk about the culture that enabled. I said, I'm not here to bear my soul. You don't get that part of me. You don't get to hear the real brokenness that is in my story. I want to talk about the culture that enabled then that is still present now because you cannot say again that you did not know. What I realised a couple of months ago was um, nothing has changed. And in fact, they went from having that meeting with me to partnering with the church that the abuse took place in. So I'm very cynical about the... I guess you could say I'm cynical about whether or not there's enough bite from the Royal Commission. And I hope I'm wrong. I want to be proved wrong. But there is no fear from churches at this point of the Royal Commission. So that's why I want to work with churches, even though I hate walking into them and it break out in hives kind of thing. My faith is important and I want to make sure that I can do something where I can say that at least there's one church where someone says, I really want to connect with my faith, where can I go? I can say, I know these guys, obviously keep your own wits about you, but I know how they operate and their desire is to do it safely and ethically and and all of those things. So that's that program. And survivor parenting. Um, Parenting sucks. I'm blunt. I don't enjoy it. (laughs) I, I, I do it to the best of my ability. I'm very arty and crafty with my kids and... And I do it because 
that's what you do. I used to work in early childhood, so I've got all my resources and I can pull out a canvas, slap on some paint and we'll do mixed media collage. And it looks really pretty, um, but I don't always enjoy it. And that's, I think, because I'm worn out. I'm 34, but I'm frequently exhausted because healing is exhausting. Surviving is exhausting. There are some mornings where I wake up and go, yeah, not today. <laughs> Not happening today. I'll pull my hair up and messy brown, brush my teeth, get the kid, my son to daycare three days a week and my daughter to school and then I'll flop and I'll have my Duna days or my I'm watching movies and I'm not functioning days so that when I'm with my kids, I'm present. Um, when I first became a parent to my daughter, um, I did all the good things of bonding. She came out literally shouting. She didn't cry. She was shouting, fist waving, nearly killed me hemorrhaged so badly and nearly died having her we did not have the best mother daughter hey nice to meet you experience and there was no program in Alice or anywhere nearby that equipped me for parenting and um, I didn't know how to, to navigate those times of toilet training because the abuse happened with me at such an early age I, I didn't want to toilet train it she didn't do it for me anyway um, my mum went and bought Terry Towling undies and I went, oh shit, I, I, I forgot to tell you, that ain't happening because I remember those. And mum went like, oh crap, she ran back to Kmart and took them back. But there were those little things and I kept judging myself, thinking, oh, I shouldn't, that shouldn't be impacting her. I shouldn't let my background impact her. And mum said to me, what does it matter if she's in cotton undies? We just buy more clothes. What does it matter? And that was that start of, okay, just because I think I should be somewhere doesn't mean it's actually a necessity to be there. So Survivor Parenting, it's, it's our most informal program. It's helping um, women go through those ages and stages. Um, my daughter's 12 and, you know, she, she thinks she's hanging out with girls that are much older than her. She's just gone into high school and they have, we come from the territory where it's seven, eight, nine in one campus and then the 10, 11, 12 on another one, whereas in Queensland, you've got the 7 through 12 on the one campus. So my daughter's been hanging out with year 11s. Not cool. Um, and she's seeing the freedoms that 17-year-olds have at school. And I'm like, you're 12. You're not going out with them. You're not walking around. And if I catch you down, at, and she's right near, her high school's right near the waterfront. So it's really tempting to get off the bus and go to the waterfront instead of, and walk the jetty instead of getting your butt to school. And I've busted her there a few times. And I, we talk about it and I'm like, and she's like, why are you so bent out of shape? Look, and, and there's like 50 other kids from the school, all the little blue uniforms running around. And I'm like, do you not get it? You are 12 and your 12 is going to be very different to my 12. Your 12, your biggest worry is you haven't got an iPhone and you breached the user contract on our phone, on the, the little crappy one without games. So you haven't got that at the moment. That is the biggest stress in your life. At my 12... I was already pregnant, having miscarriages, reading up on how to, how to have a miscarriage because I had to cover up because I believed it was my fault. I believed that what was being done to me was because of my evilness. You're 12. You think I'm evil because I say no. I was convinced I was evil because of a different life. So yes, I am going to pin you down and, and, and try and tell a story, but I will be cramping your style because I get to because I have to because you're worth it. Um, but it's really hard to do that. I think parenting is hard for a lot of people, but when you're a survivor, you're always second-guessing yourself. Am I being paranoid? Am I overreacting? And then I have those times where I feel like I say no too much and I underreact. So it's that working with parents and saying it's just an informal space, a support. We use the resources. I'm having serious resource envy, actually, um, looking at it going, oh, I need that one and that one. But it's having those things available. So talking about it. It's also the biggest... Um, game changer for this is I've, I've taught triple p programs and i've done all of that stuff but there's not enough teaching of how to teach protective behaviors when you're a survivor because it's really tricky um i know some survivors will not do it because they can't they're not in a stage where they can say the words that need to be said they can't talk about it so that's another way that we do it we do it through a real play-based thing um and getting parents to play because one of the things i didn't do enough of with my daughter and I do a lot of it with my son is playing and um, it's a play-based thing and how we play and role model 
doing protective behaviours and we do it without the kids and then we do it with the kids so that we've got that learning experience. So mum's, mum's getting what she needed because I, I, you do a lot of um, any kind of psychotherapy and I'm not very good at the formalised psychotherapy because I've got a, quite a sharp mind and I'll just run rings around any therapist and I don't get what I need to do so I have to do more experiential stuff. But um, one of the things that we do is that experiential learning and doing that inner child stuff, which I used to mock and go, <laughs> please, there is no inner child left. She died. She never was. So stick it, you know. And that's what we're doing, is providing these women with a chance to nurture the inner child that didn't get nurtured, to teach that little girl within that she has the right to be safe, that she has the right to be heard, that she has the right to own her own body, to say no, to say yes when she wants to. We're teaching the women... And then we t once they're taught, they're then equipped to teach their kids. So as I said, the website's not up yet um, because, yeah, WordPress apparently is a really easy program to set up. I, I don't agree. Um, there was about two bottles of wine that I went through and over two or three nights and went, it's not happening. And I rang a, rang a girlfriend and said, um, here's the login. Can you please do it? So we're doing that when we get back because she said no and she said, you've got to learn. So, um, yeah, she better have good chocolate or something because I'm really not good at this stuff. But we do have a Facebook page. I can, um, I am Facebook literate. So, um, and I'm doing a little bit more with the page now. Um, on Friday, I shared a, a post and a photo of me as a little girl, and I'm actually going to show the photo shortly, um, of why children are silenced. And that actually, I was quite shocked. I thought, oh, okay, I'll probably get a few likes and hopefully someone will hear it. It's been seen over 6,000 times since Friday, and it's been shared over 60 times. Um, and I've had so many emails yesterday. My phone was ringing off the hook from people saying, um, I had one woman say, I forgot about the treats. That, and the bribes, thank you, really didn't need to remember that. And I went, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> she just said, no, it'll be okay. I had to process it eventually. But she said, I thought it was just me. And she said, and I thought it was okay because they gave me that stuff. And I said, well, no, it wasn't. And you know that now. And, and we talked it through and other women and contacted me. It, it touched a core. So I'm getting a little bit bolder in what I'm putting out there. Um, it's a little bit scary, especially when I find out that it's been shared by people back in Alice Springs. And... It's being seen by some of the predators. And I keep sort of looking out at the letterbox thinking oh, a lawyer's letter's going to rock up, but I won't, I'm going to ignore that because at the end of the day, that is what this organisation is about. It is about having a voice and it is about going, well, you can do what you need to do, but at the end of the day, I will speak my truth. I will end the silence and I'm going to do whatever I can to equip other people to do that. So that is, I guess, um, a... A rough overview of the program. Once we get the facility, we're going to have things like a garden. So that, you know, again, a bit of enterprise, a um, bit of therapy, bit of that kind of thing. We're a gap filling service. We don't want to be recreating the wheel. We've got good services out there. Um, one of the things we do with the pre uh, protective behaviours is we use the resources that are there. I've written all the programs that we showed before. I've written them all from scratch. I've written all the curriculum that goes with them. That's because there's nothing like it out there where I'm at at this point. But if there's already resources out there, I'm not going to go and recreate it. There's no point. There's great resources. Utilise them and, and adapt them in. So we're a gap-filling service. Um, one of the things I want to talk about with, again, with advocacy. Um, at the moment, I'm self-funding, but I will not touch government funding. Won't do it. Um, I've worked in politics. I was a political advisor for um, a time before I had my son. And um, I learnt quite a few lessons out of that. Uh, also in Queensland, with the previous state government, people who were funded by the state government couldn't say anything. They couldn't lobby. They couldn't put out policy statements in case they upset their funding. Um, I'm not polite. I don't watch my P's and Q's. Um, I'm from the bush. We, we don't cut through red tape. We dig under the bugger. And I go around and go, OK, I don't like this. I can't play nicely. We're not doing it this way. So I'm not touching it because I believe in the programs and I'm not going to jeopardise them with my big mouth. So we're going to go to corporations and businesses and say um, the, the Emerging Destiny program, that's going to be funded by, by the businesses, local businesses. So um, I'm starting to talk with the Chamber of Commerce because I want the community to invest 
in the future generations. Um, and I want that freedom to lobby. Business with the big money, they don't care what you say. As long as their brand is out there and you behave and you don't slag them off, you can do what you like. You've got free reign to really focus on your mandate and be true to your ethics and your morals. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's one of the things. And I, I, I have quite often I get people sort of saying, why do you put it out there about your background? Aren't you worried what people are going to think? For a long time, yeah, I was. I didn't want anyone knowing that. I was okay about telling things about my childhood. I spoke up when I was 18. But people can go, okay, well, you were a kid. It wasn't your fault. But when they find out, I eventually started talking about what I did to get alcohol. And people were like, oh, my God, you're a hooker. Well, no, I, I didn't wear makeup and... I was wearing daggy t-shirts and, and shorts because I was on the way to school. There was no high-class hooking here. And let's really call a spade a spade. I sold myself for, for vodka because you can't smell that too closely. But I wasn't selling myself. I was being raped every day just to get hold of that. And that's why I talk about it because I want to challenge the words we use. I want to challenge um, our ideas about how women get in the situations they get in. Because people go, well, how'd you get yourself in that situation? Especially when I went to a group and, and talked to some police before I left Alice. That was fun. Don't really play nicely with the territory police. And, um, and one of the guys goes, we're here. You got hooked up with the Finks. And I went, I went on a date with a butcher. And it was a one-nighter that should have stayed that way. But turns out his best mate that he shared a house with was a bikey. And apparently I dissed the club and ended up having to pull a train, which was... 12 guys in one evening in the remote area at gunpoint and I said and they're going but how'd you get yourself in that situation so that was a, an interesting session where I didn't end up in cuffs because I got very very rude to police because my thing is it's not there's nothing for me to be ashamed about I'm not ashamed about what I did to survive I honor what I did to survive I think I was absolutely bloody resilient and quite ingenious in some of the things I did to cover up and I talk about it. And the other thing is working in politics. Um, nothing can be used against you if you've already put it out there. I see a lot of people getting unstuck and going, oh, shit, and having to disclose things and all the, the you know, mayor culpa and putting out these really pretty uh, press releases that their poor staff had to do at last minute with 20 minutes till we go to air. And, and I've been that speechwriter trying to write those speeches going, nah, <laughs> this ends here. I've written my fair share of, of speeches for politicians where they've been busted doing something and going, I'm not doing that. If I've already put it out there, you can't use it against me. You want to put your own spin on it, good, but it's already out there, so the, there's not the, the oomph, the surprise factor, so good luck with that. You'll just be the asshole that's trying to twist it. And there's plenty of feminists out there that will completely take you down for the victim blaming, so I can sit back and my work is done. So that is why I talk about my background because I, I also want people who haven't spoken up to realise that there are women like me and women who've been doing it for generations and, and decades before me who have been breaking the shackles of shame. Um, Courageous Hope is about advocacy, but one of the things with the women that I'm bringing on, and I've got a couple of women I'm talking to about um, employing next year, we're all survivors. We all have a story. And I do that because I want it to be, we're taking the stigma away from the victim. I'm sick of the stigma. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of being, oh, that woman, oh, she was sexually abused, so we better not. She might break. Well, I haven't broken yet. Come pretty close. But we're taking the stigma and putting it back where it belongs. Okay. And I guess it's National Child Protection Week, and I love, I love, love, love National Child Protection Week. Early 80s, it wasn't a big thing. It wasn't even heard of in the Territory at that point, not in Central Australia. Um, it's quite backward in, in that. And I was in the church world, which is very secular and, and secluded kind of thing with what we do. Um, I didn't have the language. In high school, I had a, a guidance counsellor called Mrs Hugo. I had to hit up Facebook. Couldn't remember her name. Of course, all my run amuck friends from school were like, oh, that was Mrs Hugo. I'm like, oh, that's right. And um, I had to ask the run amucks who her name. But she was the one woman who said to me in high school, she didn't know I was drunk. She busted me for everything. I don't know how I didn't get busted for drinking. Beyond me, because I was staggered half the time by the I got there. 
I was always wagging, getting running out and, and in the library for group work because I didn't do group work because it was too, it was exhausting. Having to talk and work with other people, I was tired. So I hid out in the library and read the most morbid things I could find. I was presenting to the school nurse with stomach pains. I didn't know how to tell her. There was no quality sex education in the church. Uh, the book my mum gave me, uh, you know, that now you've come to this age book. Um, the pictures had um, the male and female form naked. They had, Barbie and Ken had more detail on them than these books. And the good old, the missionary sex, the guy on top, he wasn't even in touching her. He was levitating across her. It was like, okay. So it was very devastating for me when I found out this beloved, hallowed, can't have sex till you marry and it's going to be this magical, beautiful, lovemaking experience. And then I found out it's just sex. Everything that I've been doing since I was five. And I was devastated. And I didn't have the words to tell the teachers at school. They wanted to know. I had some really forward-thinking teachers who were you know, doing the, the student-led learning uh, way ahead of their time. They wanted to know. They didn't know exactly what there was to tell, but they wanted me to tell, and I couldn't tell them. It took a boyfriend overstepping the mark when, he was at, when I was 18, and it took my mum being outraged about that for me to speak up. That was the first time my mum found out about anything. She knew I was messed up. She was trying to get me help, but she didn't know what was wrong. So she didn't know what kind of help. And you don't go outside the church for help too. Watch out for that. Because they're going to try and bring down the church if you talk about anything. So that's why I'm passionate about protective behaviours. And protective behaviours from early childhood. And like I said, I've done it with my kids from the minute they came out. Talking to them with the principals. So it's a language that they know, they're familiar with. Right through. And we've, my passion is working it and doing it with teenagers. Because there's a big gap there. And these kids need to understand that it's about consent, respectful relationships. It's not just the, the safe touching and all of those things. It's the relationship respect, um, you know, the whole lifestyle stuff. We've got to really broaden our view of what protective behaviours is. Um, so I'm really excited and I just want to say thank you for everyone who's come today. Um, thank you for listening. Um, and no one's run out of the room fleeing in terror, so that's quite good. I must have toned it down sufficiently. Um, but thank you for being here. Thank you for investing your time and your heart and your energy in the work that you do um, and for, for being open to listening. Um, as you can tell, I haven't had any statistics or anything like that up because I want to talk from the heart. And uh, I just hope that, you know, I, you're here, you've got a fire. I just hope that something I've said will stir that up because this is an awesome week it's a week that will free lives. It will save lives. I'm very firm on that. And um, I'm just really excited and privileged to be here. So thanks, Marg. Thank you so just real quick, I just wanted to show these photos. Um, the top one here is my dedication. Um, it was a small church when we kicked off and it was happened in our lounge room. So literally church was in my home from birth. So that's me when I was quite tiny. Okay, I was 11 pound when I was born. I wasn't tiny. Um, my mum and my eldest brother, Jason. I've blurred out the faces, but actually on the original photo right here is the wife of the first abuser. He was in that photo. Thank God he wasn't in the photo. It was just his grotesque wife. Um, this is a photo I shared on Facebook. Those were the party favour sunglasses that that grotesque wife gave me to shut me up. She gave me two pairs, but the yellow ones were the ones that I liked and I treasured them. She walked in and saw what her husband was doing to me. It was in the staff room of a special school where the church was speeding. She saw it. She looked at me. Dead pen face. I remember it was not just before my fourth birthday. And she walked out and closed the door. And as soon as I came out after he redressed me so generously and she handed me those sunglasses and warned me to stay quiet. I was about five, six there. I'd learnt to pose. Little girls don't normally pose like that. I was taught how to do that. There are little, apparently they're called um, antiques, real nice collector's item photos of me doing the most vile acts and I was taught how to pose within the walls of the church. And so a lot of people look at that and go, oh, she's cute. And it's like, no, I don't see that. I see a little girl who was simulating life, simulating something that she was told she had to be. And this photo is one of many I was 
seven or eight, I guess, and my hands were always in front of my crutch. It was the only thing that I knew to do, and I didn't want it. I felt so ashamed, and that was at a time where no top teeth. Apparently, that ate, that made my blowjobs so much better. That's the disgusting nature of the people that I lived with and, and dealt with. And I just wanted to show that because sometimes when people look at me now and and I don't look like I'd be easily victimised. Like I said, I'm six foot three and I wear heels because I can't shrink, so I may as well grow. And it can sometimes get a little bit lost in translation that that is who we're talking about. And children haven't changed that much. They've got gadgets, but they're still vulnerable and they still need us to talk. And... I want to be, like I said, she grew up to be the voice she needed. So I am her voice. I look at that. I'm learning to connect with her again. For a long time, I was a stranger. Didn't want to look at her. Didn't want to touch it. These photos have actually, they came out of storage about 18 months ago. Hadn't looked at them for years. New photos got taken, shoved in there. There's very few photos of me because I hated my photo being taken. All I ever wanted to be was invisible. And that was what I wanted to do. I was very little when I decided that... I wanted to be a lawyer for the UN. Didn't get there because I don't study. But it was my my idea and all the reading I did. I wanted a voice. And that's what I'm doing now. So I haven't made it to the UN yet, but I'll get there because I'm stubborn. Um, But, you know, let's just remember that this is what we're doing. They're little kids and they need us. And I, like I said, I honour you for being here and, and doing what you do. So thank you.